case, you know. Hmm? It's, a, it's a huge case. <laughs> I'd like to remind uh, everyone in the audience, please, that someone's on cell phones or those making devices. Yeah. Huge issues, not huge case. Potentially. <laughs> I'm just trying to make it more important so we can feel <laughs> that we're doing something here good. Actually, for my client, it's a huge case. All right. I'll accept that. All rise. The Court of Appeals, Division One is now in session. Please be seated. We're on the record now in uh, case CV 140650, MTR Builders, Inc., the J. Hen Realty Management Corporation. This is the time set for oral argument. Counsel, as you know, you both have 20 minutes to present your case. Mr. Willinchuk, you can set aside time for your uh, rebuttal when you come up to the podium. We do have a clock there for you to keep track of your time. And I do want to keep uh, or advise you that these proceedings are being audio and video recorded. We will. Uh, upload them to our website so people can view them. I want you to be aware of that. Uh, we have read the briefs. We're very familiar with the case, so keep that in mind as well. Mr. Willinchuk, your argument. Um, thank you, Your Honor. Um, basically, um, it's our position in this case that the court erred as a matter of law in uh, both giving instruction on substantial performance and in letting the jury decide the case on that issue, which uh, altered, in my judgment, the uh, findings and conclusion of the jury. And um, substantial completion under the American Continental case, which I think is controlling here, the Supreme Court case, um, was not a factual issue for the jury to decide under the provisions of the contract. And uh, I guess I heard a little bit of the argument before this in terms of intent of parties and contracts and so forth. but. Not that our issue is the same, but we believe a directed verdict should have been granted in this case. Uh, if the court goes back, and I'll hit the highlights as best I can, and looks at the discussion that occurred at the time of the instruction uh, settlement process, I, I think the court will see that not, o not only were there uh, incorrect statements of fact that were being asserted uh, based on the record, and I don't want to get into a factual discussion too much because I don't think that's why I'm here. And, uh, I understand the law on that, that, the deference given and so forth to juries. But the jury was not properly instructed. And at the end of the day, it's my opinion, without being disrespectful to the court, I hope, that the court simply abrogated um, her responsibility at the end, it can be seen, by basically just saying, look, this is an issue for the jury, when in fact it wasn't an issue for the jury. Uh, and, and in fact, she went further to say that uh, an issue of law, essentially, an interpretation of a contract is an issue for the jury to decide, and that's just simply erroneous as a matter of law. And then basically just said, look, I'm going to let the jury decide all these issues. And then the instruction itself compounded the problem uh, because the substantial performance instruction, which should never have been given in the first place, which I believe controlled the verdict, states uh, substantial performance means, and, and I'm paraphrasing, that MTR has performed all that is required by the contract except for light deficiencies and performance that can easily be cured. Now, that language is just not appropriate in this case. And I've looked, and I'm sure you have, at the American Continental case very carefully. That case is controlling on this court as well as the Superior Court at the time. The, the case couldn't be clearer that these kinds of preconditions or conditional requirements and contracts or final inspections by inspectors or architects in this case, as well as in that case, are not, as the court put it, and I think put it better than I can ever say it, uh, procedural chaff. Uh, we agree that the final certificate for payment is not procedural chaff. It is a major substantive right which serves a vital interest and induces the contractor to render a performance that conforms, in fact, to plans and specs, spurs them to stay with the job, and upon completion furnishes the main incentive to make conforming corrections. The trial court erred in failing to direct a verdict in Americans' favor, which is exactly what we got here, because of Rainier's noncompliance with the condition proceeding of obtaining final certificate of payment. Now, if you go then look at the dissent, uh, which is basically the position being argued by my opponent, the court 
in the majority then notes, the Supreme Court in a, in, in a footnote six, and I, I'd like to just read this because I can't, again, say it any better, uh, says, additionally, the dissent relies on the doctrine of substantial performance, apparently satisfied that Rainier's deviations were so trivial, trivial as to give rise to the doctrine, despite contradictory evidence. By express provision of the contract, the party set up a system of progress payments whereby the agreed upon value of full compliance by Rainier with the plans and specs called for within the contract and as vouched for by the architect was the final payment by American to allow, and I think this is critical, to allow the doctrine of substantial performance to operate here would fly in the face of the original intent of the parties and would nullify the contract. Now, contrary to what my uh, opponent says, the Prompt Pay Act in no way, in no way other than setting a 14-day requirement for the response by the uh, owner, uh, in no way changed the doctrine, the language, or the principles that were set forth by the Supreme Court of our state. And that law has never been changed and modified. The uh, op opposition was successful in basically convincing the court to just, as I say, abrogate her responsibility to, to direct a verdict and just throw it to the jury with substantial performance instruction that, that skewered the facts, the admissions on the record of the facts, that are, are, are clear um, in terms of the operative facts that no final approval was ever given. And that final inspection and approval was required regardless of the certificate of completion by the city of Tempe. That's the point, or, or what they referred to as occupancy, but everybody agreed was the certificate of completion. And even the city inspector understood that and testified that until the final inspection and approval is given by what was in this case the architect inspector, that it is not complete as far as even the city is concerned. So at the end of the day, um, you know, it's really that simple. If one just compares the operative facts, which I've done, and I won't take uh, all that much time in, in, in saying this, I hope, but the actual facts in American Continental are so compellingly similar to the operative, again, material facts in our case, in terms of what is clear that was not done here and admitted not done. And in fact, our case is even stronger because we have additional factors that weren't even considered in American Continental that were also admitted to be non-complete, i.e. the lien waivers. And the contract language in our case is repeatedly, paragraphs 2.3, paragraph 3.1, paragraph 13.2, paragraph 6 of the amended contract are so clear on this point that not only was there never any waiver by my client of that strict performance, but the record is clear by Mr. Dalkey, who was the architect inspector, by the city uh, inspector, by even uh, Mr. Rohani and his expert, Michael Martin, on these material points that the architect never approved and that they understood on the other side that that was required under the contract and that no none of the lien releases in, in issue here were ever obtained. Now, they had problems in obtaining them, but again, that's not my client's problem. And, and so at the end of the day, uh, I will reserve time, Your Honors, uh, to answer any questions or, or answer them now and then reserve time, but this is not horseshoes and hand grenades. You know, you don't get it right by just being close to the mark. You have to comply with these critical terms of the contract that our Supreme Court has said very clearly are not trivial. And the only thing I can say beyond that, really, that I think is pertinent is, um, you know, the, the, the fact is that my client bargained for something, um, and, and, and they, they claim now that this is a Lowman's case, that this is a case similar, if you recall, to the, to the Lowman's case, which is a very well-known case uh, uh, dealing with that, you know, uh, store at the, the, the old, you know, that was a 32nd account, uh, uh, Lincoln, um, and they paid their rent a little late, if you recall, and the court said, well, we're not going to deem that to be a material breach because it's a trivial breach, and therefore the jury or whatever can consider that issue. I can't remember the exact how that came up, whether it was jury or the court on a summary judgment right now, but in any event, it doesn't matter. Uh, the court said, we're not going to find that to be material as a matter of law. That's not this case. 
And for them to even cite that case in the context of a construction contract that specifically calls out the preconditions, and in light of the specific findings by the American Continental Supreme Court case that deals with this very exact situation, says it's not trivial, it's not immaterial, that issue should never have been determined by a jury as to whether or not it's trivial, material, whether they came close to the mark or not. If they meant it, they meant it. And that's why we argued a directed verdict should have been granted, and it should be granted by this court based on the undisputed facts in the record that are not in dispute. And the court simply, if you look at the transcript at the time of the instructions, simply threw up her hands and said, you know what, I think there's issues on both sides. I'm just going to let the jury decide, including interpretation of the contract. That is absolute error. And I would reserve my time, and thank you very much. All right. Thank you, counsel. Good morning. I'm Denise Troy from Dickinson Wright, and I represent the plaintiff appellee, uh, MTR Builders, Inc. I disagree with learning counsel on so many issues. I believe that the jury properly was given the instructions both on material breach and substantial performance because the material breach instruction says if there's a material breach, you cannot award damages to the breaching party, which is precisely what Jahan has been arguing since the end of the trial. If you, yes, Your Honor. Let me ask you a question, counsel. Um, so how would you distinguish the Rainier case? The Rainier case deals with the, the contractor was required to go out and, in Rainier and get a certificate of, fi of financial approval from the architect. This case differs in the fact for two reasons. One, the requirement of getting approval from the architect is conditional. It's not an absolute requirement of the contract. The contract leaves that up to the owner, Jahan. In addition, and most importantly, the architect was sent out there without MTR's knowledge on June 28th after MTR had requested on numerous occasions that it, a walkthrough be had. And they got a response from the agent for Jahan saying, Mr. Tabat will be handling the walkthrough, Mr. Tabat being the principal in Jahan. He will handle the walkthrough. The architect went out there. MTR went out, made the repairs it believed it was responsible for, then sent the list back to the architect and said, let me know if you want to repunch this, this project. And the architect responded, and I quote, I do not plan to repunch the project unless requested by the client, the client being the owner, Jahan. This email was copied to Mr. Tabat, and Mr. Tabat never said to the architect, you need to go back out there because we're waiting for the, the final approval of you, the architect. Never once asked for it, even though MTR was ready, willing, and able to go out there with the architect and walk the project with them. And Jahan never did it, which is the distinction between Rainier and this case, because it was not required that MTR go get the final approval. It was required that Jahan did it. And they can't come into this court and say, well, we prevented this, con this condition from occurring, but you're responsible because it didn't occur. What, uh, what were the tribal issues of fact here? The tribal issue of fact is whether these, these alleged um, deficiencies were, were material or not. The, uh, the, 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 the alleged deficiencies, and, and they've kind of backed off on the certificate of completion, was the, uh, the failure to get a final certificate from the architect, which it wasn't MTR's responsibility to get it, it was Jahan's. The second was the, the, the lien waivers. And yes, there were two lien waivers missing. However, MTR went to the leasing agent for Jahan, who had been handling the local work, on August 1st. And it's completely undisputed that he went there with the lien releases to pick up the payment. And these, for the most part, were unconditional lien rele releases, which were not required by the contract. He went there on August 1st, 2011, to provide the lien releases. They didn't even bother to look at them to see if they were all there. They just said, we're not going to pay you today. And so 
if it had been determined back in August 2011 that there were some lien releases missing, then MTR could have done something about it, but nobody told them until the trial that they had failed on this particular condition. In addition, this was a curable defect. Can I ask you a question? Yes, certainly, Your uh, Honor. Um, how would you interpret uh, Section 12.1 of the contract with Section 2.3? 12.1 states, should the owner or contractor fail to carry out this contract with all of its provisions, the following options and stipulations shall apply. And then in section 12.1.1 states the party may seek recovery of damages incurred as a result of said breach. And then section 2.3 states owner reserves the right to designate a third party inspector with no affiliation or relation to the contractor who will inspect contractors work quality and then report to the owner subject to the inspector's satisfaction each draw will be dispersed how do you read those provisions well the, the, the going to 2.3 first that's precisely what we were, were talking about the owner had to call out the architect to do the inspection and I think the punch list of the response to the punch list, he did call out the architect to do an inspection. And it, it wasn't a complete final walkthrough. My client said to them, come out and check what I did and make sure so you can sign off on it. And the architect said, I'm not coming back out. So it was under 2.3, the owner was to call out the architect, the third party inspector. And what was the, it was 12.1, Your Honor? Is, is your argument then that that conduct constitutes a breach of the contract under 12.1? Oh, no, Your Honor. No. Non-payment is, the, is, the, is the, the breach of the contract by Jahan. Okay. I, I wonder if, if you might agree with uh, p at least part of Mr. Willenchik's argument that normally uh, we, we, we have our, our judges make rulings as a matter of law and contract interpretation, we don't normally send those to the jury. I would agree on contract interpretation, but this I don't believe this was an issue of contract interpretation, that, that the judge said let it go to the jury. It was an issue of whether there were, had been a, a failure of a material condition. And materiality is a jury question. It is not a, court, a legal question, and that's why she sent it to the jury, because there was enough facts there for the jury to determine, was it really material uh, that they didn't get the lien waivers? Because th those are the only things that, that, that MTR concedes it didn't do correctly, because it couldn't, it did not have the right to call out the architect, which is the American Continental case. It only had the right to say, we're ready for the walkthrough, we're ready for the punch list, we're ready for the architect to come back out, and Jahan didn't call him back out. And the certificate of completion was issued on July 26, so that's, that's a non-issue. And there is also an argument that the approval of the architect was only required to obtain the certificate of completion. And once the certificate of completion uh, was provided or, or signed off by the city of Tempe, the architect's approval was no longer necessary for, for as a condition proceeding for, for final payment. I mean, this is a, such a fact-based case because the, the, the legal issues are, are, are not, there, there are so many facts. What did Jahan do? What did MTR do? That it is, these are all perfect jury questions and, and the court was correct in sending it to the jury. You're suing on section 12.1 though, right? Is that the provision of the contract that you brought your breach of contract claim on? Yes. Does because they defaulted by non-payment. Okay. The, the contract, and, and the contract is actually um, in violation of prompt pay in, in that it says you, pay, you will pay us within seven days of receipt of the, the final pay application. They didn't even receive, inf they didn't even receive a response from Jahan during the first seven days. And, and the MTR worked, tried very, very hard to do what Jahan was asking it to do to get payment because it had been on this project for quite a while. I believe the, the contract goes back um, to the end of 20, 2009 and it wanted to get paid. It wanted to pay its subcontractors. 
And so it's, it, it submits its, its billing in accordance with the contract, which says when you've finished all the work, you will submit your uh, application number five. It asked for a walkthrough. It asked again for a walkthrough. It finally heard back from uh, Ms. Underbeg, who was the agent, saying Mr. Tabat is handling the walkthroughs. Can I ask you a question, counsel, in Sir. that regard? You, you're talking about this, this series of events of, of what you allege to be um, your client asking the owner's inspector to perform a walkthrough. And is what your position is, is that the evidence is that they refuse to inspect the property? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, they, June, they didn't do so in good faith? I'm, on June 1st, when my client submitted his final invoice, its final invoice, to the owner, it said, please arrange for a walkthrough. It received a, an email on June 10th, 10 days later, saying, Mr. Tabat, will be, who is the, uh, the principal in Jahan, will be in charge of the walkthrough. Um, they, so my client did not hear anything more until June 29th, when he received an email from the architect who had been sent out to perform a walkthrough by the owner. My client went out and fixed those items he believed he was responsible for in the punch list, sent that punch list back to, to the architect. The architect then responded and said, I don't know whether you did these right or not. I'm not going out there unless the owner tells me to. So he, my client requested an additional inspection by the, the I architect. I understand those facts. And what's the legal significance of all that conduct. That, the legal significance is is that my client cannot have uh, failed to comply with a condition precedent if the owner was not getting the, the contract that the architect back there to inspect the property. Okay, so are you arguing that that was a breach of the contract, that the owner didn't inspect when your client asked him to, and under the facts of this case, he should have inspected the property? I mean, I know you're arguing non-payment is the breach, but are you arguing that? I'm not arguing that failure to inspect is necessarily a breach because there is no absolute requirement for inspection. It's only Jahan that's saying there's an absolute requirement for inspection. The contract says the owner may have somebody go out and inspect. Therefore, it's conditional. They don't have to. But then they can't come back and say, we're not going to pay you until the property is inspected. So they waive that right to inspect? That would be, that, I think waiver is too strong a term because I believe it would be more they decided not to take advantage of the provision of the contract that allowed them to do it if they wanted. But by failing to do so, they can't come back and say, we're not going to pay you because we never got the final, final certificate from the, from the architect. The ultimate, the material breach is the non-payment. Yes. Uh, and very briefly, uh, Your Honours, I, um, I believe Rainier actually does not uh, apply anymore, at least to construction contracts, because of the policy set forth in the Prompt Pay Act. If you have any questions on that, I think I've briefed it uh, adequately. The other thing is our crop. In your view, to, to distinguish Rainier other than that? The fact that the the, the, the prompt, your argument is the Prompt Pay Act has rendered that invalid, but is that the only basis upon which you think Rainier is inapplicable? No, I believe uh, it, Rainier is inapplicable because the Supreme Court specifically found that the contractor's failure to, to provide the final uh, payment certificate from the architect, a payment certificate it was obligated to obtain. It was a condition It was, was a condition precedent. And in our case, the, the, the documents that they're asking for were not. So I believe you can, I believe you can find an MTR's favor without getting anywhere close to saying that Rainier is bad law. Uh, as, to the, as to the prompt pay argument that we had submitted, the, the statute is very clear that within 14 days after a contractor submits an application for payment, the owner is to get back to the contractor and tell them in reasonable detail what the basis for non-payment is. The only thing that 
MTR received in that 14-day period was the email from Ms. Underbeg on Friday, uh, June 10th, which is Exhibit 10. It starts at page 12 of the appendix. And in that email, Ms. Underbeg says, well, we can't... We, can't subdu we cannot schedule a walkthrough. We need to get this third party to come in and push in the fire, uh, the fire alarms, and then we're going to have to get the architect to walk it. This does not say we are not going to pay you for these reasons. Because under the statute, the owner is supposed to have somebody out there within the 14-day period to make a laundry list of what's wrong and why they're withholding payment. And they didn't do that in this case. Uh, and that goes to your argument that they didn't object within the 10 days. Right? Yes. What about the argument that the request for payment was premature? It, under the contract, it's not premature, Your Honor. Under the contract, it says that, uh, uh, that the fifth, the fifth um, draw may be submitted um, upon completion of a laundry list of work, and that work had been completed. They, they didn't think so. I, I, they... It's, it's interesting, Your Honor. They don't say, no, you didn't do the, uh, you didn't do the finished plumbing or the, the, the electrical or the bathrooms. They never, that, that has never been an objection to the payment. It's always been, you didn't do the rest of it, which was the conditions for withholding payment. But the, the, under the contract, the, they were entitled to submit uh, pay application number five when this work was completed. That's at 3.1. I understand. Uh, but uh, there's the, uh, the sequence, as I understand it, is, um, you know, your client says, we're done. We, we, we want payment. And um, I, I understand your argument that the objection wasn't specific and so forth, but they, at least within the 10 days, respond with something that says, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that that work is done. And then later on, I, I recognize it was June 29th, they come back with a punch list of items saying, here, here are the problems. And then your, uh, your client works on that punch list uh, to, to try to fix it. But I, I'm just not sure what, under the, the Prompt Pay Act is meant to get these draws paid on time. Right? Absolutely. I mean, that's the purpose of it. It's not a breach of contract. Uh, it isn't a replacement or substitute for breach of contract. But at the same time, it, it's hard to argue it isn't premature when there's still the work isn't finally completed. I mean, at least that's what the court saw. I mean, is that well? Actually, the court basically said that the email that was sent, Exhibit 10, that was sent on June 10th, did not contain reasonable detail, but it was enough to put the contractor on notice. The, the statute requires reasonable detail. Right. It, it did say that, and it seems like that was the primary basis for its ruling, but it did mention that it was premature as well, too. Well, the pay application was not premature under the contract. My client submitted the, the pay application on June 1st with a cover letter that said, please schedule the walkthrough. If you're complying with the prompt pay, you schedule the walkthrough within the next seven to ten days so that the owner can come back and go, we're not going to pay you because there's a crack in the concrete, as there was in this case. And we're not going to, we're going to, and you haven't provided us with all the lien waivers, and therefore you need to provide those to us before we will pay you. That's not what they said. They said, we are not going to, we're not going to schedule the walkthrough. It's not we're not going to pay you. It's we're not going to schedule the walkthrough until we have a third party come in and put in the fire protection system, somebody that was not in contract with MTR. So essentially, Johanna is saying, you have to wait for, for us to pay you on something to do with a third party over which you have no control. And the and the, the Prompt Pay Act does not apply to us because we need to get the project finished with third-party forces that you're not responsible for. So you're going to sit and wait until we're ready to pay you, which is precisely what the Prompt Pay is, was, put in, uh, was put into effect to prevent people withholding payments from, from contractors for, for years. Um, I'm almost out of time. Have you any other questions? Not me. No, thank you, Councilor. Right, thank you very much.
Let me just say, I, I think we've gotten with that argument by my colleague uh, off the point. First of all, it is not a may, it is a shall under paragraph 13.1. Uh, she repeatedly said that the owner may. It says, upon completion, the project shall be inspected. There's nothing in that provision or anywhere else that I've read, and if I missed it, I apologize, but I looked at it again, that points out that it's my client's responsibility before a payment, a final payment request is made to somehow make sure that Mr. Ohani does what he's supposed to do and gets the certificate of occupancy from the Tempe, which he may or may not have ultimately done, but he never, ever provided that to either the architect or my client, neither one of them, ever. And that's, that's undisputed. So whether he got that or not, that was one of the steps that he had to take. Following that, to be simple about this, he then had to go to the architect, and the record's clear on this, and the uh, testimony of the architect is clear on it, if nothing else, that he never got that certificate. He therefore was premature in his request for final payment and demand for final payment within seven days, I might add, demanding to come in that Monday and, and wanting to have to be paid before he would comply with the contract. That's not, contrary to what, what counsel stated, what the contract provides. That's why the American Continental case is right on point, because okay. what it says is these Mr. are preconditions. You're a, you're a terrific advocate, and, and I enjoy listening to you. I really do. It, it's, it's enjoyable, but I want to try to engage you for a minute. Sure. So let, let's have a discussion here about something, because I want to really understand uh, a couple things about your, your argument. Now, when I look at the Rainier case, um, you're absolutely citing I mean, you're citing it word for word and what it has to say. Um, the only provision that is cited in that case is the specific condition precedent section. Um, when I look at this contract, there are, there are these sections 2.1 and 3.1, and make sure I'm citing the correct sections. 2.3, 3.1, 13.1. I think you also, 2.3 and 3.1 are the primary ones, but you also did cite 13.1. now And 13.2 and paragraph 6 of the amended. I mean, you obviously know this contract far better than Well, I'm I just do. trying to answer you, sir. No, no, I know. Yeah. I understand that. I, I, um, when you look at 12.1. 12.1? When you look at 12.1, it talks about should the owner or contractor fail to carry out this contract with all of its provisions, the following options and stipulations shall apply. And then it talks about and 12.1.1, damages occurred, incurred as a, a breach of contract. Here's my question for you. There is no similar provision mentioned in Rainier. It doesn't talk about a general breach provision. So if you're going to if you're going to argue a condition precedent, it has to be clear and unequivocal that these condition precedents are not only things that have to be done. To, to seek payment, but that's your only remedy under the contract. And, and, What's and, our only remedy? Withholding that, a well, payment? You have to, the, you have to, in other words, you have to satisfy that condition, and failure to satisfy that condition precludes any payment. That's that's what that's what the law says. No, no. Let me. You want to have discussion? Let's, I do. Let's do it. Hold on one second. Let, let me finish because sure. I, I want to. I'll give you the rest of the time. Sure, sure. Um, so here. It, there is another provision. There is another provision in the contract that talks about a breach of contract remedy. So, so if I'm faced with that question, explain yeah. to me why it doesn't work. All right. With all due respect, I, I don't think paragraph 12.1 has anything to do with this case. Um, it, 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 there, and there is no law that says, what, with all due respect, you stated. I don't read anything in American Continental that says if there's an alternative remedy available and the parties don't choose to opt to take that alternative remedy, that the preconditions in the contract requiring final payment are somehow null and void. That's just not the case at all. American Continental doesn't have any reference to what you just said. It doesn't say that because there's a potential specific performance provision, because you can declare a contract default, because you can terminate a contract, any of those possible remedies that the law, of course, would provide, or equitable remedies for that matter, that the issue of the interpretation of when you're entitled to be paid and how is in any way affected by any other potential options that you may but choose not to take. In this case, what my client chose to do is to say, you haven't complied with the contract. And it's not a may, it's a shall. It's not we have to arrange for you to do this or that. You have to get this and that. And it was made clear on June 10th. 
in the same email that counsel refers to. You haven't done the following things. We're not going to schedule a walkthrough until you get us the lien waivers, until you get us a certificate of occupancy from the town. That's all we have to do. We don't have to declare the contract to be in default and breach and then go after him for damages or anything else, with all due respect. That's just not part of the, the deal. And I don't think American Continental says anything about that. Uh, for that reason, because there's always additional remedies in contracts. Uh, every contract, with all due respect, again, that I know of, uh, has an alternative pro provision most of the time that says this contract does not limit you to other remedies at law or equity, to specific performance. We both know that when people file lawsuits to breach a contract, which we didn't, they did, that they can opt for certain remedies. I understand your position. Yeah. So let me follow up with this question. Sure. The, the contract uh, talks about inspections. Would it have been a breach of contract for your client to refuse to inspect the premises? I think that it's fairly stated, yes. I think if, if there was evidence in the record that the, or, or submitted to the jury as an issue, which I don't think it was, um, that my client somehow interfered directly with their ability to obtain a walkthrough, I believe that the jury could have been submitted that issue as an issue in the case and stated that we frustrated directly their performance. I don't think any interrogatories were given to that effect. I don't think the jury was ever, I don't think it was even argued to the jury, quite honestly. I understand. If, if in fact, I, this is a hypothetical yeah. for you, if, if in fact your client, it's, it, despite the conditions present that you have to sign off on this work and do the inspection, if your client had said, I, I'm just not going to go out there, I'm not going to, not going to play ball. Sure. Then. That would be a breach Absolutely. of 12.1 because it would be owner failed to carry out this contract with all of its provisions. Absolutely. I agree okay. with that. And I think that if that were the case, uh, I couldn't stand here and justify that conduct at all. Fair enough. Nor would I. Um, so basically, you know, it's really very simple. Um, when you get right down to it, not only, first of all, let me just correct a few things in the time I have left that were misstated. I think it's important. Um, if you go to the transcript and you look at, I think it's page um, 85, uh, March 14th, day four, again, there's so many misstatements that were made, and, and I don't know if they were intentional or unintentional, and I'm sure they were unintentional, but you can see on page 85 the following quote, right at the top of the page, line 14, the court, okay, let me look at that. I see what that says about final payment, and what the court was referring to uh, there was the provision of 13.2. Um, when it was handed to the court. And she says, and I quote, it's up to the jury to decide how to look at this and decide how to interpret it. That's just flat wrong. It's not up to the jury, as Judge Kimmel said. It's an issue of law, and as you'll see without taking... Don't give him any credit in this oral argument. Oh, well, that's, it's, that's it's fair. It's difficult enough I know. to know. But it could be up to the jury if there was ambiguous language. That's right. That's exactly right. And if that were the issue... I would agree with you. And if, if the court said that, that there's actual ambiguous language in 13.2, which there isn't, it's very clear what you have to do, um, that, could, that could be a fair comment. But that's not what she was doing here. What she was basically doing, you'll see later, is basically at the end of that discussion, uh, throwing up her hands, literally, and saying, um, you know, I, I think there are facts to support both instructions, which is the anticipatory repudiation and the uh, substantial performance, so uh, I'm going to allow them. And then counsel, you know, who tried the case, not me, said, just for my record, I still think the America, which of course is the American Continental case, is right on point, does not apply to this particular set of facts based upon that case. And I would argue that he had it dead on. Under that case, there is no ambiguity here because the provision is almost identical in reality uh, as much as one could be. To the, to the factual scenario that was applicable. And as I said, we have even better facts in our case because, again, there was no certificate of occupancy for the architect to review in order to issue the final punch list. Um, the town inspector testified that he believed that nothing was final until that was done as far as the city was concerned. Mr. Martin, their own expert, admitted that it's not final until our architect approves it. And, and more importantly, Mr. Rohani of MTR himself understood the process, and that's what's so uh, frustrating here, um, is that Mr. Rohani testified in this matter uh, that he understood it. Uh, so question, and this is a trial transcript, uh, March 13th, page 103, uh, I believe, or 73, I'm not clear in my notes, lines 1 through 11, 
either one of those. I'm not sure. I apologize. Which day? Uh, that's on uh, day uh, uh, March 13th. I th think that's the next to final day. Uh, it's probably day three. Uh, anyway, it says um, he admitted that question. Now let's move up a little bit in the contract. It's in the contract. If you look at section 2.3, owner reserves the right to designate a third party inspector and subject to inspector satisfaction, each drawer will be dispersed. Do you see that? Answer, that's correct. Question. So that's a right of the contractor to have your work reviewed. You understood that answer? Yes. It's not like he didn't understand how this worked at all. Um, did you understand that the architect was going to be our third party inspector for purposes of draw five? I assumed. Uh, page 75, lines 8 through 12. Question, and until we had both approval from the city of Tempe and some representative on the part of the owner, there would be no fifth draw. You understood that. It was your language. Answer, there is no fifth draw. Question, no fifth draw until those two preconditions had been obtained. Answer, from her client, that is correct. Um, he never provided that certificate. Question, at page 103, lines 14 through 17. Check, I I get the sense maybe you've got quite a bit more there to read. You are at a oh, time. Oh, I'm sorry. I, you know, I, I didn't realize that. That's okay. Did you have something you want to wrap up with in a couple of final sentences? And well, I'll just wrap it up by saying this. Um, we did comply with the Prompt Pay Act. Obviously, all it requires is the court held was reasonable notice of our position, which is the same position I've advocated here for the last 20 minutes, that the conditions of the contract weren't fulfilled, and this matter should be remanded. There was no substantial performance issue that should have ever been given to the jury, and their verdict reflected an error as a result of that. Okay. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, counsel. Appreciate it. We will uh, issue a written decision in due course. Court's in recess.